Hi, everybody. Uh, Natasha Starkel. I, um, I have a number of hats. So today I have a, a hat of a blogger and observer. I blog for Goal Europe. That's my company. And uh, occasionally I also blog for TechCrunch. That helps with networking. So today I'll talk about going global to, from Eastern Europe. And uh, I don't have a global company to talk about. But uh, over the past year or so, I've made some observations. I've met and spoke to a lot of people. And I'll, I'll probably give you some examples and then conclusions on a purely academical level of uh, what I think people have to have uh, in order to be successful in going global from our region uh, and what you should think about and, and be prepared to deal with. That's crazy, by the way. It's a um, Hungarian startup. Well, not longer a startup. Hold on, let me see how that works. There we go. So um, I've thrown together some logos. Some companies from Russia and most of the Central and Eastern European countries are here. There are a lot of success stories, a profitable multi-million dollar companies. There are some of them are that raise funding and they are on the way to becoming profitable and global. There are some fairly young companies as well. But uh, what I wanted to show with the slide is just to see that in every country from Russia to Macedonia, there are, there are success stories. And uh, they have a pretty, uh, actually many things in common with each other. I should probably have included Ganymede and FilesTube uh, on the slide from Poland, but when I was doing it, there was um, a Cadility that I knew, and uh, they've uh, got some exposure through their participation at SeedCamp and Hackford, so I have a Cadility from Poland on the slide. Um, I'll tell you a few examples. So I'll start with, oh, sorry, I have to press the wrong button. I'll start with Gedjar. Do, do you guys know Gedjar? Any of you doing mobile development, mobile games? Gedjar is a Lithuanian company and it's the largest free app store in the world. They have 30 million monthly users. There's, there's been 2.7 billion downloads to date and they have about 100 million apps in their store. The company started off really, really a long time ago, actually before the iPhone exists. It's, um, it's been started by Ilya Laurs, who at the time in 2005, 2006, has been running a web development companies, which also developed games. And what they did is, um, in order to test Java games on different mobile devices, they needed a community of testers. So the GetJar, and JAR is actually the, um, the, the uh, extension for a, a Java archive, uh, they created this website and they allowed people to become early testers. They would get games for free and they would only be required to do one thing, to say, does the game work on your device or not? So that's how they started. Pretty simple, um, didn't expect to make any money with it, but what they found is that there was, on one side, there was a lot of interest from the users to download the games, so they effectively created a distribution platform. And on the other hand, they have also saw interest for developers uh, game developers that wanted to test their apps through GetJar. So it became a community, still a free community, and uh, which grew exponentially. So I think they've grown to a um, million users within a year or so. I don't remember the exact statistics. And um, eventually, with the number of developers going into thousands and tens of thousands, um, they had to start prioritizing who's whose apps will be featured on the front page because they became just too many apps, too many games. And uh, that's how the monetization mechanism has been introduced. Basically, if you want your, your mobile app to be featured, you have to pay for them to be on the front line. And um, so that has become very profitable. But the company, actually, they were approached by investors themselves. Like, it's one of those miracle success stories that, you know, can you follow the examples? Yes, maybe once in the blue moon opportunity like that comes up. But uh, at the time, um, a lot of mobile development companies in the US were spending money on getting users like, through GetJar. And Axel at the time, um, a hugely successful American fund, has been, um, three of their companies were spending money with GetJars. And it was increasingly uh, expensive thing to do. So the more users they wanted to acquire, the more money they had to spend with GetJar. And Axel approached um, Ilya Laos, I think in 2006 and 2007, and they have invested in the company. Uh, after that, the growth continued, 
the company now raised 42 million dollars and uh, yeah so they, they they look at different ways to to expand the user base but it's pretty much a success story they are playing with profitability they reinvest all the profit that they make um so i'd out, out safely put them into a success story file on in, in goal europe we are, we are filing them as a as a success story are you sure about that? whether or not they well yeah uh, yes, uh, Ilya Laurs has stepped down as a CEO. They brought in an American CEO uh, simply because um, the company has development resources in the U.S. They have clients in the U.S. They have investors there. It's it's a huge market. So yes, yeah, so he's um, he's become a company evangelist, and uh, the management is American right now. No, that's, I think it's. Mm hmm okay. Yeah, it's not a public company, so you can't really verify the figures. So you can rely on the statistics they tell you and the investors that, that back the story. Yeah, so that's the only... Mm. Okay. Oh. I don't know, Praise is doing funny things. Hold on. There. Next story. Do you know parallels? Good. Okay. <laughs> Do I have to make a talk about that? Uh, Sergey Belousov uh, is probably one of the most successful uh, technology entrepreneurs in Russia. Um, his background is this. He's uh, built a very successful TV production company called Rolson back in 1990s in Russia. They had a turnover of about $500 million. At some point, uh, he said, it's not my ambition to build TVs, so I want to do technology. And um, he and his partners created Solomon Software, that was an outsourcing company back in the late 1990s. They also tried to, to sell cheaper version of Solaris uh, servers to Singapore. For whatever reason, they had network there. Uh, Bill also had a passport for Singapore. Uh, that didn't work out very well. Uh, the Solaris uh, type clients, did not, did, they didn't want to have lower prices. They wanted to have a reliability that Sun Microsystem provide them. So that business didn't work out. They went back um, and they looked at the trends, uh, late 1990s, beginning 2000, uh, software service, Linux were keywords, and that's how they got into virtualization software. Called the company Software Soft. I uh, struggled uh, for quite a while to, um, to identify the direction. Had a lot of products, too many products. That's what they think it was a, a mistake on their part. Uh, finally focused on virtualization software, uh, raised uh, funds. Um, one, I, don't, I don't remember the name of the fund, but they, um, they raised uh, funds from the uh, Western VCs and that helped them bring the American um, Western management team and uh, Parallel has grown into being a, a pre-IPO company. They have over $100 million in revenue and it's a leader in its field. So the background, it's, it's a B2B software. It's uh, someone who had been able to fund his own seed round um, and um, it's one of those few success stories that also has a, a few failures on the way. Invisible CRM, I don't know, that's probably a less known company. I wouldn't quite call them a success story yet, but it's uh, one of the companies that gets traction uh, and it comes from Ukraine. Um, the founder is uh, Vlad Voskresensky and another one is Anatoly Gavirdovsky. They are... They have a background in outsourcing, and part of um, my bread and butter is uh, um, advisory on outsourcing services in Eastern Europe, so I, I know quite a few players in the region. Um, Vlad Voskresensky sold his outsourcing company, Afortio, to the leading um, outsourcer, IPAM, and I think um, that allowed him to concentrate his efforts on developing a software, which is also a B2B software. Invisible CRM is a, started off as a middleware that connected uh, Microsoft Outlook to Salesforce. So they were solving their own problem. They said salespeople have spent too much time reporting on their sales activities rather than sale, and we should help them focus on uh, selling rather than reporting. So that was the, the step. They raised 1.5 million uh, from, I think, um, from Estonian uh, venture capital firm and there's yes and um, 
They're profitable. Well, they, no. Okay, again, that's what they say. They are. They are, they are breaking even. They invest, reinvest all the all the money into building the product. Again, outsourcing background and uh, business to business. Uh, Log me in, Hungarian company. Do you guys know know them? B two B. Well, it started off as remotely anywhere. It's um, um, technology that Martin Anka developed uh, in his spare time when he was working for Uproar, the um, the gaming company that was owned by his partner Michael Simon. Well, Michael Simon was then uh, his employer. Uproar was a multiplayer um, web games that was the company was sold to uh, Vivendi in the year 2000 at the peak of the market. Uh, Michael Simon then went on and he had an outsourcing company which was called Fathom Software. It was also sold to EPUM, uh, and um, they've started remotely anywhere together. And they were raising funding, I think, in the year 2002, when um, that was really difficult to do post-bubble. Nobody was investing. But uh, 3TS put money into the company. That's the, uh, the Eastern European uh, private equity fund. And they've also got uh, investment from the US, US VC fund. So um, don't know them personally. I'm still getting to um, scheduling a call to, to speak to Martin Anka personally, just to get to know them. But um, Right now, the company is uh, publicly listed. It has over $800 million in uh, market cap and uh, $120, $140 million in revenue, 1.4 million paying users. So, AVG, well, I guess everybody knows AVG. What's interesting about this story is that uh, the company was founded in the early 90s, and four years later, they got their first customer. So it was a bit of a hobby business in initially, and they've been giving away a lot of their software for free just to get traction. And um, yeah, the in, I don't know, was it 96? Or, no, I, I think it's early 2000 that um, Jan Kritzbach decided to sell the company to a private equity firm. And from then on, for 10 years, the private equity firm backed the expansion and growth, and eventually the company went public. So it's, again, a nearly a billion dollar company. Uh, boring antivirus. Um, B2, yeah, it's, it's more B2B, B2C, B2B, B2C uh, software product. Uh, anybody knows eRepublic? Okay, some players here. Yeah, that that's probably takes me to the example of gaming. So before I, I spoke primarily about the B2B startups um, and another sort of... Um, Another trend in Eastern Europe is a lot of gaming companies uh, get traction and get success. And uh, eRepublic is one of them. They, they've developed a pretty cool concept for, for, for the massively multiplayer online game uh, that's based on the geo, um, geo strategy, geopolitical strategy. So um, the players come from each country. The more players from Poland or Serbia or UK you have, the more powerful um, the country becomes. So that created a viral factor. The, the players that were really active within the game were uh, paying for advertisement of this game within their own countries. So the, 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 the spread was really viral. They reached um, the, the company. The idea was formed in 2006. They launched in 2008, so it took two years and uh, over a million of venture funding to actually create the, the game. Uh, the, it was seed funded initially by the co-founders. Uh, the co-founder... Uh, George Lumnaru, he had an online shop, so he had a bit of a seed funding himself, but he also partnered with an investor locally. And then they ended up bringing in the uh, Sp Spanish investor on board, and they had uh, an, a very good advisor on board, uh, Toby Rowland, I think the, the guy who founded King.com, he was on, on, on the board of director, and uh, that was a big... Um, I guess influencing factor for eRepublic to become successful, and so they they got the launch game 2008, and only last year they saw the hockey stick grow. So it took another two three years for them to to get um, to over two million users. Half time. <laughs> okay, I'll have a beer. <laughs> Uh, the only B2C startup uh, I can think of is Badu. You guys know Badu? Anybody? <laughs> Use Badu? <laughs> um, 
Andrei Andreev is Russian, so that's why I consider Badu to be a Russian startup, but it's, it's actually when he started Badu, he was living in Spain. And before Badu, he started two other successful companies at least. And one of them was Bigun. Uh, in Russia, it's a contextual advertisement platform. Sorry. Yeah. Before Google Ads were in place, they already had the idea of uh, doing auctions for AdWords. And um, they became profitable within two or three months of launch. And that worked really well. So uh, he, he ran this project for a while. Then he started Mamba, which is a, a dating website. It's like 1.0 dating website in Russia. So users can create profiles, upload pictures, chat with the other users, uh, get interactive. And uh, the, the really interesting thing about Mamba was that the users could pay uh, with an SMS to, be, uh, to have a premium profile, so to, to be on top of other users, sort of featured users. And that has become viral because the price of that was pretty small, but the reaction of the users on, on your profile to be featured was really, really very high. And uh, Mambo has become, again, profitable within a couple of months. And uh, it, at its peak, it's probably had over 9 million users. And they also did some interesting things with white labeling and uh, sharing user base with other with other brands in, the, in this market. So then he moved on to Spain, and in Spain he tried to create a photo sharing site, which got a bit of attraction, but it was not profitable. And this is one, he, this is why he moved from photo sharing app into the Mamba type dating network, uh, where people could promote themselves, promote their profiles, and, um, and that has become Badoo which has, right, well, last month, had 150 million users. Some of them are fake, but it's, you always get that on dating website. Uh, but who is the only really big success story I can think of in, in a B2C game, uh, area where, which is very, very hard to do because you basically need a lot of marketing budget to get the users. Unless you have some viral factors like um, online games, uh, social games, you have to have the budget to do it. And Andre, with his previous businesses uh, generating quite a bit of cash, he could afford that. Um, he brought in the external investor who put in $30 million uh, in, the, in the minority stake. It was a Russian company called Finam. And uh, that was maybe I don't know, 2009, I think, he did that. Uh, so it does take quite a bit of cash to, to get to the level. Uh, so, yeah. So that's, to conclude this, there's two basic features there. The founders who created their businesses and went global successfully, they had their money initially. They, could, they didn't need to raise 10 or 50,000 euros. They actually managed to, to, to fund that and beyond uh, to create the product, to create initial concept, to show the traction. And uh, after that, they went on. They, a lot of them either created, they got external management in place, or they, um, they moved physically moved from, from their countries to Silicon Valley to, to, to the UK. So that's pretty much summarizes it. And the gaming and B2B is, is two leading fields where those successes were possible. Um, I, attend, I, I did a couple of posts on my blog about whether or not outsourcing companies will, will drive innovation in the region because on, from my point of view, outsourcing companies have that sort of cash flow that they, and they have technical resources that they could use to, to create startups, to create technology, internet companies, and take them to the first level, to maybe fundable level. Uh, there are people that argue against that because they say, well, if you have an outsourcing business, it kind of corrupts you because on one side you have the cash flow, you don't really want to move too much or sweat too much to get anywhere further. And on the other hand, you don't have much time because you're, you're tied up operationally with this. Um, there are arguments, pros and cons, but I see a lot of companies, actually we've done a, a, a huge market research effort in the past year with, um, with my firm. We uh, interviewed uh, 800 companies that do outsourcing in the region and a lot of them are working on their own projects. And most of those companies that have their own projects in place, they're actually quite small. So it would be 10, 20, 30, 40 people sized companies that realize that they're not going to make it big in outsourcing. Uh-huh, thank you. But they, uh, so they're looking for other uh, sort of strategic moves. Uh, just the observation on, on outsourcing. The challenges, yeah? Two American programmers. Yeah, outsourcing to American programmers. I mean, American programmers work for you. No. Darn. <laughs> we need to be outsourced too, you know? <laughs> well, 
Well, maybe we should just expand our focus from being Eastern Europe focused to uh, international focus. There you go. But you guys are expensive. Well, we can fix that. <laughs> Not for long. Not for long? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a separate subject. So, uh, what are the challenges? I mean, start with money, let's start with ideas. Um, first of all, okay, take Poland, take Russia. Huge markets internally, why should you bother building something globally where you have to understand the foreign culture, you have to understand the foreign business environment, you have to understand, uh, you have to network to meet the right people somewhere else when you can just build a business and get successful uh, in your home without going through the pains. Oh, and the pains there are, if you, if you want to go and live in another country, and I went through this pain, I moved from Siberia to Switzerland, from Switzerland to England, from England to Germany. Every time I knew, like I know it, I know I, I'm going to move from one country to another, there'll be a little bit of a, a adjustment, but eventually I will, I, will, I will settle in. And every time I thought it will be easier, but it's not. Actually, you have to go through quite a bit of a cultural change and, um, and you have to do a lot of work to establish your own network, establish your presence, understand the cultural elements, how you do business, how you talk to people. You have to establish a network. You, have to meet people in person, uh, connect with them, um, let them uh, learn, get to know you. And it's not easy. People say that in Silicon Valley it's much easier to fail because uh, people accept failure and, and that's why you should all go to Silicon Valley and, and, um, and build global startups from there. I think it's a good idea, but also it has its challenges. You, you need to know how to, how to become Americanized a little bit. Um, another question is, do local ideas work abroad? There's a company called Buddhist in Russia. They have a pretty cool idea. Um, if you want to wake up in the morning, somebody will call you up and wake you up. And a stranger, complete stranger. So apparently it works really well. I didn't try it. And, and it's very popular in Russia. There's over 100,000 likes on like a Russian equivalent of Nasha Kaza. But in the US, it didn't go. And there's actually two Russian startups. One Russian startup cloned Buddhist, and both of them went to, to take on the US market. It didn't work. Just people did not like the idea. It works really well in Latin countries, not in the US. So some ideas don't really work abroad. And that's an example. Another challenge, and I think it's a pretty big one, is the smart money. Um, the VCs that know how to build technology companies, the, they, on one hand, they know how to build global technology companies. On the other hand, they know how to pick the winners within their own culture. There are not that many. And those, one, those, those ones like Runa Capital, run by Sergei Belousov and others, and Almas Capital in Russia, like, they take a big part of the equity. And they have limited funds. Okay, Runa has now raised the size of their funding to 130 million. And they expanded their focus, and they actually invest globally. But um, the, the, the funds are few and far between. Uh, Runa. Runa. Runet have, um, yeah, they're quite, they have quite a bit of their own money that they invest, but Runa, they, they raise money from, um, I'm not sure who put money into them, actually. I need to check that. I don't know if they actually announced that they, who, who the um, backers are. I know that in Almas Capital, they, they have institutional investors, so they work with Cisco and the likes. But Runa is different. Bill also invests his own money in Runa as well. And yeah, paperwork and visas, yeah. I have an English passport ever since I got that. Life has become much easier, but otherwise it's visas, it's work permits, uh, it's a paperwork you have to deal with. So, key question I have. Okay, I have not much time, go. Um, five minutes. I don't know if I attend startup conference, like I've, I've attended so many startup conferences, maybe over, or over 10 or 15 in the past year, and uh, I'm kind of getting a conference fatigue at this point. But it's, it's a good place to go if you have a good idea and you need to, get, to build your network. I mean, those of you who have a network who, um, who work with uh, foreign businesses, you probably don't have this need um, compared to the other ones that, that just make the first steps. But having st attending startup conferences is useful to meet investors, to meet the press, to meet other people wh whom you can discuss ideas with. And I found it very helpful. Um, yeah, um, if you're planning to raise funding from the international VCs, you, you'd better meet them in person. I think it's probably a simple 
thing that all of you know already, but uh, VCs like to have either warm introduction, some, somebody introduce you to them so that they look at your business plan or you know them in person. So that's always useful to know the, a few VCs. Um, and say hello to the press. Uh, the press also like to know people they talk to in person. It helps uh, because, um, well, that's a separate subject actually, the press. So these are the names of the VCs. Uh, you, you all know the Polish VCs, Hard Gamma, Innovation S, Speed Up Group, Seven Investment, IIF, MCI. Anyone else I don't mention? No? Okay. In Eastern Europe, Runa Capital, Speed Invest, it's an Austrian based fund, Credit Ventures in Czech Republic, uh, RSG Capital in Slovenia. There probably are a few more. And European, for there are a number of European funds that invest uh, globally or you're Europe wide. So Early Bird is one of them, Kima Ventures, um, Axel, Atomico Index. Sandstone Capital and Point Nine Capital. Right. Now the press. Uh, it's just, just. These are the faces. <laughs> you see them in the conference room. Come, approach, pitch, get the business card, add them to the social network, uh, stay in touch. It helps a lot if you want to um, pitch your story to them eventually. And accelerators, I probably will not have much time on accelerators, but um, I talked to um, a number of companies that went to seed camp and they say that the network effect is really, really good. So you move from your country to, to England, to London, you meet investors and within three to four months you, you, you raise your funding once you are selected by seed camp. But you have to go through the funnel. Uh, they review about 2,000 companies per year and they select 1%. No, one percent. Yeah, about about one percent they select. So it's um, chances are not as high. Hack Forward is, has a fantastic uh, acceleration program as well. I'm a referrer for Hack Forward, by the way. Um, they the way they do it is uh, slightly different from Seed Camp. There is like a quarterly meetings and mini conferences that you attend. You work with experts. If you need an expert on gaming, you talk to people on gaming. If you need an expert on marketing, you talk to, to them. There's always um, a few VCs attending the event. There's always a few executives like uh, last time, last on, on uh, Saturday, there was a CEO of uh, Deutsche Telekom who presented at Hack Forward, which was really good. So they're useful. Of course, they take a big chunk of your equity, it's up to 30%. Uh, with Hack Forward, SIPCAM takes, I think, 10% 10 for 50,000 euros. Uh, so you have to decide whether or not you want to part with your equity. But um, it's, it's a good place to start. I have two minutes. And finally, consider moving abroad. That's what a lot of people do. So that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Please follow me on Twitter, uh, Google, everywhere.